Okay, we're going live, Bear. We're going live. <coughs> Are we live? Where's D live? Are we live? Oh, yep, yeah, we're live. We'll get D live over on this one. Okay. Good on that one. Um, I can run it all from here. Okay. Hey guys, we're doing a little something different today. We're both here in the uh, the wonderful Illumin Docs office. So we'll hit record in just a second. Um, how are we sounding? Are we sounding okay in the chat? If you can just give us a thumbs up that the sounds okay, that would be awesome. Yeah. Okay. Boom. <laughs> it's, it's funny because I'm watching on a delay here. So you were hitting me, but I wasn't seeing it. I was like, I'm in, I'm in an alternative reality. Okay. Awesome guys. I'm going to hit record and we're going to fire this up. Bears at the helm over there. So you're in charge with the tech. Is that good? Supposed? Yeah, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> no, you're good. Nothing. Good. Uh, just talk. Um, oh, you're going to have to hit record, though, okay. when I say. Uh, okay. Here we go. And the sound's okay, everybody? Yeah? Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Bear, um, we're going to go ahead and hit record and you can hit record to the, uh, record on this computer. Yeah. Why not? And boom, we're back for another episode of alpha cast. We've got a special one today. Bear and I are in the office together here at the alpha Vedic gardens, uh, in celebration of the release the premiere of our uh, episode one of the documentary film series we did for Iconic. And this episode is called The Magical Land. So that's what we're calling this alpha cast today. We got a special in-house chat today with just Bear and I. Uh, so hopefully a lot of people are coming into the live stream. We're going to be taking questions and uh, just having a wonderful casual chat uh, about the making of this film and everything going on with Alpha Vedic, uh, with the farm, with our community and, and all that. So we thought it'd be a fun uh, change of pace for us to get together at the gardens here and in Bear's office. So uh, i just excited for the summer, man. It's good to be with you in person in your yeah. Orphic field. I do uh, not let just anybody into my uh, inner sanctum here. <laughs> well, I had to go through a ritual to get in here. We won't, I won't say what that is, but uh, you'll see the black eye next week. Uh, so we're back. Uh, we're going to talk today off-grid living, permaculture, self-doctoring, and a trending desire to return to our free-range roots are today's hot topics. There is a growing awareness that our very survival and right to thrive are at stake in light of those who desperately seek to subjugate the masses. Alpha Vedic is a multi-generational evolution with roots in the pioneering circles of alternative medicine, homesteading, and those who simply sought uncompromising freedom. On today's episode, we'll share insights we've gained along the way and what you might expect if you choose the path to sovereignty, whether off-grid or in an urban environment. We'll take you behind the scenes in the filming of The Magical Land, an Alpha Vedic documentary directed by Bryden Lando, Bear's oldest son, uh, in conjunction with the Iconics film crew from Great Britain. Expect the conversation to touch areas that will be the subject of online offerings on our soon-to-be-launched private membership site, as well as on-site workshops. Whether you are a practitioner of the healing arts, actively farming, or engaged in conscious parenting, Perceptive skills must be retrained to reveal nature's hidden in plain sight secrets. The AV educational platform will focus on the repeating patterns underlying the three kingdoms of creation for practical application with the expectation of positive results. 
The Alphavedic Permaculture Farm is a farm to pharmacy operation from the cultivation of medicinal herbs and biodynamic foods, processing in our Spagyrix Alchemy Lab, and the production of teas and advanced herbal nutrient formulations to complete the self sufficiency loop via conscious commerce. With our constant stream of outstanding AlphaCast interview guests, it's rare to have an intimate gathering of the AV community. So we are excited today to be joining with y'all. And definitely, um, if you guys got questions for us, put them in all caps um, in the chat. I've got uh, YouTube, Odyssey, and Be Sovereign all up here, uh, and as well as DLive. So uh, we, I will be monitoring the chat on all of those. It seems that YouTube still, or LooshTube, or as Bear affectionately calls it, DoucheTube, uh, is seems to be the most popular uh, thread still, but... We'll get there. And also we will be um, uh, streaming directly to the private membership group and be doing some private streams as well. And that'll be all be on alphavedic.com. So definitely uh, go join our mailing list if you haven't already at alphavedic.com, because that is the best way to stay up to date on when we launch uh, the new site and everything else we're up to. Uh, Bear Lando, what else is going on in your world today? Uh, changing hoses since 5.30 this morning. I get up every morning in my bathrobe and go out as you caught me out in the North 40 still wearing my bathrobe, but I just change irrigation hoses for hours and hours. So uh, got a lot of stuff to water around here. But uh, hey, this will be fun. Um, where do we start? Do we go into uh, the making of the movie? Well, yeah, we could touch on the on the making of the movie, and then I think that would be a great segue into the making of Dr. Bear Lando, because <laughs> uh, a lot of the movie actually, had, it's really cool. We have some archival footage in it from your childhood, which is really special. Uh, what is that, 8 millimeter or 16 millimeter film? And uh, and just some really cool backstory on, you know, where you come from and uh, as I obviously see you as a mentor of mine and somebody who's helped me really see the way. And I think it'd be cool for our community to kind of get some insight into what your journey was. I know you've talked a lot about it uh, in snippets here and there on the podcast and other podcasts, but I think it would be really fun to have a little more of a deep dive on what uh, what were the, you know, sort of the instrumental uh, moments in your life that directed you towards this path. Uh, and of course this film goes into that, but I think it would be cool to even expand on it a little bit today and really tease what this film is going to be about. Also, the, it, the film will be premiering on Iconic on Saturday. Um, in the show notes below, we have a link. I'll put it in there after the show and it'll be on the podcast show notes as well uh, to get a free 10-day trial to Iconic so you can watch the film. OK, so everybody should be able to watch it on Iconic. Uh, they have an app that goes on uh, the, the Amazon Fire now or whatever or whatever that's called the Fire Stick. It's on Roku, I believe. Um, and then, of course, you can just watch it online. So you guys can uh, everyone should be able to see this film when it comes out on Saturday. And you just were with Gareth Ike yesterday, right? Yeah, we did a little uh, pre-premiere interview. So uh, he had me introduce himself to the Iconics community. I've been on with him before. So, uh, yeah, so it's like old home week. Uh, Ike's are great people. And, um, and I'm really honored to have, uh, gotten brought into their whole community. And, uh, you know, David, of course, years ago, I was involved with, uh, some, um, I was in a leadership council where we had a group where we did offshore seminars. And uh, this was before internet and everything. And, you know, David Icke was one of our feature speakers and both David and I were young men at the time. And uh, he was just starting to introduce his first, uh, his first book. So it's kind of fun now, you know, I'm working with his kids. Uh, his kids uh, are working with my kids. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's great. And they're all about the same age, but yeah, Gareth is, is a great one. And Jamie, of course. And we've got to know some of the other people behind the scenes. You know, it kind of surprised me, actually, um, when they approached us uh, about doing an, um, a documentary uh, and also a documentary series, uh, not just one. I thought it was just going to be pretty much about permaculture or, you know, whatever the trendy thing was these days. 
And uh, they kind of made it a little personal, which uh, to be honest, I was a little uncomfortable about, uh, you know, and then they pulled out some, uh, of course, with the help of my son who retrieved, you know, out of some old family movies that I hadn't watched probably since I was a kid and uh, digitized them or, or however they do it. And then, uh, you know, featured some of those uh, clips in the movie. Uh, there, there's boxes of those things, you know, my, my parents were, uh, you know, doing whatever it was back then, you know, it's really crude photography, but, uh, you know, I, I even had some, I remember my dad went to one of my college games and, and filmed some stuff. So we've got all sorts of stuff on there. So, um, cool. yeah, it was uh, interesting when I saw the, um, the rough cut, because it's like, whoa, this is uh, a lot of stuff about me in there. I thought it was just going to be us talking about permaculture. And then a lot of the uh, information that I thought was more, um, you know, things that I would have thought to be more interesting just about, you know, the soil science and all the stuff I was talking about there. And we had a lot of footage. Uh, didn't quite make it. And, and I think what they were trying to do is just get more of a personalized uh, episode one that could be user friendly and, uh, you know, really not just talking to the uh, permies out there and to the soil nerds. And, and you know, because we, you know, out in the garden, we're talking about all sorts of levels of science and how it relates to uh, everything from medicine to waveform physics and stuff, which I thought was cool, but, uh, you know, maybe not that interesting for most of the folks. So, um, but it was fun, uh, really a fun experience. And, um, you know, of course, you were there the whole time and and you've got uh, some, uh, you know, really good uh, footage of yourself in there and your whole thing. And, and also some stuff that we thought was great that didn't quite make the final cut, but I guess that's what happens in every movie. So, um, yeah. Now there's a lot that happened in the filming and, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but what, what do you have to say in the meantime? Well, you know, I, it's always awkward when you're, uh, the star or you're the, the central character in a piece like that, because it's, and you're not used to that, you know, it's, it's, a uh, challenging to the ego in many ways, right. Or challenging to, uh, yourself because it's like, whoa, uh, do people really want to hear about that? And yes, people do there because, uh, you've had a lot of effect on a lot of people with your amazing career and everything that you've brought to light with, you know, from the terrain stuff to biodynamic farming and all the science and everything. And it's just really fascinating to see where you've come from. And I think uh, people are, are attracted to the hero's journey and are inspired by it. And so, uh, you know, one of the, the major stories, storylines of that, of course, is losing your mother at an early age, uh, which I think was a defining moment for you. And we talk about that in the film. And there's some archival footage of your mom with you as a kid. And of course, your brother's doing the old uh, <laughs> rabbit ears over you and stuff, uh, which is classic. And I mean, do you want to talk a little bit, not necessarily to that, because we cover that in the film, but what, what it was like growing up with, you know, uh, at that time and with your brothers and losing your mom? I mean, that kind of effect, I'm sure, was um led you to start questioning at a very early age right yeah uh i had a lot of interesting experiences early on and one thing they brought out in the film that they wanted to capitalize on for some reason that i was a, a hellraiser as a kid uh definitely a troublemaker uh you know and and then seeing myself with my two brothers in that footage with her you know we were definitely a handful for her. <laughs> and uh so it's pretty hilarious because i hadn't seen that in a long time but, um, you know, we were country kids and also we grew up with broken English, um, you know, different kind of culture, Italian. My mom was uh, dual Italian and Peruvian. So, uh, you know, we we're kind of multicultural, but we were in old uh, Northern California and a lot of our extended family were dairy ranchers in the area. And we're just out playing in the hills all the time and, um, uh, you know, very traditional Latin Catholic. Um, you know, I ditched church whenever I could later on and, and uh, <laughs> you know, as well as school. But, uh, you know, it was just a different time. It was a, it was a very nice time. Uh, my mom was uh, fantastic. She's a very educated woman, uh, even though she, you know, came from immigrants. Uh, my grandfather 
from Peru who had quite an amazing story. I'll tell it real, real quick. Uh, you know, he was a uh, boxer, professional boxer, international prize fighter. And uh, he came uh, to the States, but overseas when he was fighting, he ran into Jack London, the writer. So they became uh, lifelong friends. And there was actually a book written about the two of them. But he was kind of swarthy, you know, and, and very South American looking. So when he came over and settled in San Francisco, he couldn't, you know, really get a job other than just doing grunt work like, you know, the rest of my family did from Italy. They just had to keep their heads down. But they, you know, were um, just amazed at the opportunity here, and they all did extremely well. But that particular grandfather, he uh, got a job in a foundry, you know, a real dismal job in the basement, uh, you know, hot, horrible conditions in the foundry of Simmons Mattress Company. And um, long story short, he took up swimming uh, to condition for his uh, boxing career. And uh, he was so good at it, he actually made the U.S. Olympics team. <laughs> and so now the, um, the, the people in San Francisco, you know, the good old blue bloods of San Francisco, just like they, you know, exist on the East Coast, invited him into this exclusive club called the Dolphin Club. And their whole thing is they're swimmers as well as just sort of the elitist of the time. And so he's now, you know, rubbing elbows with uh, them. He's a real laughable guy. They like him. And plus he's, you know their token Olympiad and their swim in the San Francisco Bay and all that kind of thing. And um, so he worked his way up from the foundry and ended up becoming, uh, you know, an executive, uh, you know, within Simmons Mattress Company. He poured his heart out into the war effort, uh, you know, refabricating submarines because he saw the dismal living conditions, you know, and he, he, he won a, you know, uh, Medal of Honor for the war effort, you know, and he was doing that. But uh, he, uh, because of that, you know, did very well. And then my mom got to benefit by going to private schools and colleges before women went to college. So that was my mom. She was very wow. educated. She tried to uh, educate me and uh, teach me piano and everything else because she was a, an accomplished pianist. And of course, I resisted. I just wanted to be outside. So she gave up. But she was a baseball nut as well. And uh, so uh, she was very proud that I was always, uh, you know, kind of leading the little league and, and baseball and, you know, on into high school and everything before she passed on. So that's that's my mom. And we'd be out camping because they were like early environmentalists uh, of sorts. So we spent a lot of our childhood out camping and fishing. And uh, w when we were out in the boonies, she was always trying to get the Giants baseball game on the radio, you know, and <laughs> so she was, she was uh, quite a character. Loved, uh, loved mom, of course. Oh man, that's a, a true American story right there, right? Yeah. Immigrants coming over and, and finding success like that through their own will and ability to succeed. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, and isn't there a grove, a Redwood Grove? Uh, connected to your uh, your grandfather? Yeah. Richardson's Grove State Park, uh, which still exists. And, um, you know, just as when you're in Mendocino crossing into the Humboldt, uh, you know, county line going north in Northern California, you hit this very windy, narrow road through these huge uh, redwoods. And they were trying to cut all of those down. So my grandfather, and at that point, he had a little bit of clout and him and his buddy, Jack London, uh, uh, went after the state and said, hey, no way. And so they actually, because of their efforts, made it into a state park. And to this day, they're still trying to cut those down so that, um, you know, they can get tractor trailers through there quicker to bring, you know, large shipments of crap, you know, Walmarts up in Oregon. And so, you know, it's still a struggle. But my grandfather's the first one to save those. And he was the first honorary camper at Richardson's Grove State Park. You know, now you need, uh, you know, reservations to, you know, camp. But back then, we were the only ones in the campground. So we spent a lot of our summers up there in the big trees, which is, uh, you know, why I kind of have that in my blood and, and why one of the reasons why we're, you know, Deb and I chose this area here because we're back in the big trees, just a little north of that in Del Norte County. Yeah, that's interesting because that area, it's, it is really magical through there. And that's actually one of the areas we were looking to do music and sky. There's a venue right there, uh, but they went a little too normy on us and wanted uh, certain restrictions for the, uh, uh, the crown, uh, <laughs> the crown V 
as they call it. Um, but what a what a cool place. And uh, so interesting that oftentimes in this community, people get triggered by the so-called elites and their their you know um, habitats that are set aside. But I think there's a more nuanced perspective here when we look at these you know at these quote unquote elite circles that there are those who are benefactors for, for nature and, and doing things to protect it. And I think it's important that we keep an open mind about certain circles out there like this dolphin club, because nothing is black and white. Nothing is purely dualistic. There is always gray area. And there, I know many people that have lots of money that are out there trying to do great things. Uh, so uh, I think that's uh, an interesting side note there on what was going on with trying to preserve some of these redwoods, because there's I know there's like the uh, the grove the you know, that the, they meet and they worship Moloch and stuff. There's Rockefeller Grove and stuff like that. So there's two sides of the two sides of the equation there. But that is cool that your grandfather was involved with Jack London to preserve that amazing nature right there, because it is a very cool spot to drive through. Um, and the uh, elitists, we don't call them elites, they're elitist. Yeah. Um, they, of course, like their little tokens. Uh, you know, just like in my medical profession, um, I had a lot of those kinds of people for clients. And they, you know, respected me because I helped a lot of them out of tight situations. And so, you know, they do befriend regular folks that don't grow up in their circles but then uh, when you get to know them, they also uh, let on that they really don't have much respect to, for anybody else out of their circles that uh, isn't useful to them. We'll say that. And I agree with you, Mike, though. It is comforting to know that uh, they'll be preserving the redwoods uh, after they kill everybody. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, they're, um, yeah, it is very Luciferian, isn't it? In, in yeah. a sense, uh, that's like the pseudo light, you know, it's good for them, but they'll then poison everybody else. Um, yeah. And that, you know, uh, good segue over to where we are here in the land. Um, you know, there are redwoods just around the corner here behind the farm. There's some amazing trails that just go here. And it's interesting land right here because we're on the South Fork of the Smith River and it can be actually quite uh, warm and has multiple ecological zones, but there is also, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but there's more, what, um, biomass per uh, square foot here than I think even the Amazon jungle. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, by far. I forget the numbers, but it's, it's really significantly larger. And, uh, you know, another elitist story about Big Flat, which is where we're at. How many houses do you think are up here? I don't know, a dozen or... Yeah, it's just mostly old homesteads and, and ranches and stuff, maybe 12, 15. What's nice about it, you know, we're out in the boonies. We're, you know, an hour away from the nearest power lines. There's no cell reception. So, you know, we're fending for ourselves out here. And it is a little community, even though you can't see your neighbors. We all, you know, know who each other are. And, uh, you know, we've actually had some uh, friends from the Alpha Beta community move up here recently. Um, Alec and Emily. So that's great. And then uh, also uh, next door over that away, we have some old friends that uh, we knew on Maui. And, uh, you know, they're uh, doing some great things over there, putting on herbal workshops and doing music events and, and uh, you know, beautiful river. And this time of the year, there's no place on earth where you'd rather be if you were ever up here. But the story I was going to tell is that uh, this area is unique because the homesteads that are up here, it's not country funky. It's actually, everything's like well-kept and nice houses. And, and um, you know, it's not a place where you, you get out in the boonies and there's old cars, you know, in people's yards and everything. It's really kind of upscale. And uh, I, I, I want to tell a side story. Well, as we call uh, off-grid elegance. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we do have another little channel that we're going to launch, which is going to be purely homesteading. It'll be um, have its own uh, uh, channel, but also it'll be integrated with Alpha Vedic. When we're doing that uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, a lot of people just want to see what the off-grid living, you know, is like. And so we're going to do more shorter segments instead of, you know, for people that aren't into sitting around for a couple hours and listening to us. And um, also uh, when that inevitable day comes, when douche tube kicks us off entirely, 
uh, you know, we'll have another channel under another name. So it, that's going to be fun. So expect that probably in about another month. <laughs> I forgot your dog's under there. I'm like, what are you doing <laughs> playing footsies with me, Mike? Um, so fun. anyway, where was I? Oh, Big Flat, you know, long ago, uh, they cut road a road into this area. And you have to uh, cross two areas of, um, of the river, you know, the main fork and the south fork, which, which is where we're at. Uh, you live on the main fork. And so um, that was done by the elitists because they recognized that this was an amazingly uh, just just crazy, beautiful place up here. And also it was considered sacred by the Native Americans, of course, nays to come uh, summer up here. And, um, you know, just abundant wildlife and, and beauty everywhere you look. So uh, they cut a road up here. And um, it was kind of tricky, but they did it first class. So we had this great road to get up here. Uh, you know, our last farm that we left to come here, uh, you know, and develop, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, similarly remote, but not nearly as nice of a road. So it was really an ordeal just to get into the closest town. So we're out here remote again, but, you know, it's very nice. Um, and the elitists cut that because they were originally intending a group of them to have this as one of their little hideaways. Something happened. It's a different story for another time. But um, uh, other people ended up taking over the original homesteads. And, and it is what it is today. One of the most unique places on the planet. And everybody up here, of course, has to provide for themselves in every way. You know, there, there's no uh, there's no nothing available from the grid it's just too far away so uh yeah so we feel fortunate and also the smith river as we always talk about is uh, i think probably the cleanest river in the country right now it's undammed and um you, you know it's just you don't find places like this anymore you know we work hard around here long long hours and then we go uh you know jump in the river we've got shannon who's uh living on our uh uh, property next door at the guest house there and uh, you know she works and so we always uh, go down there Deb and the crew and there's usually visitors and, and jump in and just float around on inner tube so the water is amazing it's like tropical clear and uh, very brisk yeah. and even in the middle of the summer you get to have a Wim Hof experience but it's great because it's so hot and it's just very refreshing. Yeah, the water, uh, as you, as we've talked a lot about the quality of water, right, and how important it is as an information carrier, you can feel it here when you get into the water here. And where I live in Gasky, there, um, uh, Horace Gasky, who was the founder, he, that was a, uh, a, a health sanctuary that they had built there where the North and Middle Fork met, where people from Europe would come these, you know, so-called elitists would come from Europe to come bathe in the healing waters of the Smith River back then. So uh, there is something quite magical about the water. And that's what drew me to what was the final thing that brought me here? It was like, whoa, I got to live on this river. And it uh, is interesting water. Uh, we're going to do a and Bear and I've been talking about this for a long time, doing a show on primary water. I'm talking to Ann O. And uh, about doing a little panel bear, uh, maybe in, uh, we have a couple openings that, uh, in July and August, bring a couple phenomenal people on to talk about primary water. And it's interesting to think maybe the Smith, you know, a lot of these springs bubbling up into it is literally this primary water that's coming up into this river. Uh, and it's feeding from, you know, these craggy, uh, deep cavern, uh, deep um, shallow sort of cavernous areas through the mountains here where the water's coming through. Uh, and so it's just resonating at this high, high frequency that is phenomenal. And that is, of course, the water we use to grow the herbs and everything that goes into our teas. So mm -hmm. we're hoping that that resonance, well, we, I'm not hoping, we know that resonance from the water is literally being delivered to you through our products. Yeah. And the South Fork, uh, right there out my window is um, cold all year round and never recedes even in late summer because it's coming up uh, a great deal subterranean. And uh, if you look out my window, there's mountain ranges all around. They all converge here and all the water is coming down from there and then up from the ground. And so it's just pristine year round. Uh, 
And it's also, by the way, very high in transitional elements. You know, we talk about transitional elements, um, you know, Ormus, some people think of them. Uh, 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 our mineral products all have transitional elements in them. So you're getting that very you know, rich amount of Ormus, uh, orbitally rearranged monatomic elements. And David Hudson, who first discovered those as a soil scientist uh, back in 90, uh, you know, I uh, met him out in Maui and we, we did some workshops and uh, that's where I got involved in the Ormus way back then. And we learned how to extract it from uh, concentrates of aloe. And back uh, then also there's a company called Manatech and I was one of the uh, main doctors that was uh, uh, you know, featured by Manatech uh, because we were on the, 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 the pioneering forefront of that whole Ormus uh, you know, thing then. And, uh, you know, again, using uh, aloe concentrates to get it. But since then, we've, you know, learned how to harvest them out of the water. I have a contraption here that I, you know, run the water through and get it right out of the spring and, uh, you know, concentrate Ormus. And, uh, but we still use that um, aloe concentrate that's rich in that uh, because it's great for the gut and, and a lot of other things, your, your immune system. And that's in some of our products as well. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer, though, mm -hmm. the, the ORM, right? Orbitally re rearranged monatomic elements, because it's kind of based more in particle physics or uh, that, where really it's, yeah. it's a different sort of understanding that we have. And that's why we call them transitional elements. Yeah. And uh, when David Hudson first discovered these uh, weird elements that didn't behave according to the alleged laws of physics, you know, if you concentrated a certain amount of them, sometimes they actually float and, and, and just do really strange things. Uh, he, you know, called them Ormus based on the atomic theory of matter. And now, because we understand things more from a waveform physics perspective, we understand that every element on a periodic table is in transition, depending on what octave it is in. It's in transition to, uh, you know, becoming the next um, element within that octave, and then they jump octaves and do all sorts of fun stuff. They ascend up the musical scale, uh, just like we do. And um, yeah, uh, we also have Andrew Kaufman coming on uh, very soon, and he's going to be talking about the fourth element of water. And, uh, you know, with a, an understanding that water has these miraculous properties, and just like transitional elements. Uh, it doesn't behave itself, you know, for instance, uh, you know, why does uh, hot water freeze quicker than cold water? Uh, you know, why does, um, uh, you know, why does water expand when it freezes? And it goes through all these different states. So Andrew is going to be talking about that with us. Uh, I'm also going to get into the uh, weeds a little bit with them uh, about water from an alchemical perspective. Because if you look at the ether and understand that water is a conjugation of different layers of the ether, and then that is, you know, one of the fixed elements that is literally the transmitting utility of the etheric patterns, uh, you know, as they do their final precipitation into form, it explains why, uh, you know, some of the people we've been talking to as far as why water records and why it does all the amazing things it does, you know, when you freeze it, uh, you know, then it, it takes on these patterns as Vedic was telling us about. So uh, yeah, that'd be a good one. Yeah. I mean, uh, you could say in uh, water is consciousness. Water is the, you know, the above and below, right? The, the rivers below above and below uh, are essentially the, uh, the conscious shell around us. And that's literally how we interact with this realm is through water. We are water, everything's water. So the more that we can understand how to harness that, the better, and the more we can um, uh, really make sure that we're, we're protecting the water, or at least we're honoring it. Uh, and, you know, the first step I would say is stop buying bottled water at the store. I know it can be very convenient, but figuring out ways to find water from a natural source have it in glass, uh, structure it. Uh, one of my favorite things to do, Bear, is you have a spring right here that comes out of the mountain 
uh, and I went and invested in some nice uh, glass jugs uh, and uh, um, go out, I come over here and I fill them up for when we're camping or just have them at home. And it's just the quality, the qualitative effects of a water like that, that's been structured through a mountain and that's coming from nature like that is just, it's, it's so massively different than having water from your tap or even just filtering it or buying it obviously from a store. So it seems so basic, but this can have massive effects on your life if you just respect water as a living consciousness. Yeah. And that spring is so special. We always uh, refer to, you know, we, we're going to go talk to the lady at the Springs. You know, there's uh, definitely a living consciousness here and we fill up our water periodically. In fact, Deb's doing it on the way home today. So uh, yeah, we're fortunate. We have pure water. Um, and, and again, that goes into all of our crops and everything we grow here. Uh, you know, we talk to other people that are into permaculture and doing great things elsewhere in the country, but you just can't find the conditions we have. You know, they talk about when they go out and water their plants, do their irrigation, you know, it smells like a swimming pool because they're still hooked up to the grid and the plants feel that. And, and you know, we still get nailed by air um, you know, when they uh, target the coast or try to target the valley on the other side of the mountains from us. So we do get a little drift of the chemtrailing sometimes, but we're still very protected because there's so much forestation here and so many buffers in between. Uh, but, you know, it'll drift over us. And, and sometimes we still feel the effects of that, but our plants are more protected. We're more protected than just about anywhere else I can imagine. When, yeah, there's a lot of natural orgone, obviously, here right. that's being generated all around us. And I've installed some um, orgone um, pipes, uh, uh, grounding pipes and stuff on the property. But you really don't even need to here because it's just naturally abundant. And you can feel it when you come on the property. That and also we're, you know, miles and miles away from any, um, you know, electrical wires and all that stuff, even though there is solar here and there's those elements, but uh, you can really feel it when you're on the land here. That's why we're calling this first episode, the magical land, because it is really preserved according to, uh, I guess, how Anastasia lives in the Ring Cedars books, right? Um, just out in the tundra there, uh, or out in the, um, what do you call it? The, uh, in the, in Russia there. Um, Siberia, but the Siberia, uh, told whatever it's called, starts with the T. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can feel it when you're here, and uh, it's just uh, it's it really is a magical place. So hopefully, guys, you can that will come across in the film. We had an amazing cinematographer, Michael, who came out. We shot this all in 4K, and uh, it's really beautiful looking too because we really wanted to capture that. Uh, that essence here on the on the on the uh, digital side of things. So um, hopefully you guys can stream this to a high definition television, and it will come across in a way where you can really get that feeling of the of the location here and the plant life and how immersed we are in nature. Um, one question on the water thing: uh, people are wondering about uh, pH. I know we have some pH products, but Thoughts on can, I don't know if you how you pronounce this, Kangen, Kangen water machines and pH in relation to personal voltage and electric body, electric health. Great question. Yeah, I don't want to uh, step on any toes. That's Those aren't bad machines, uh, you know, in the right hands. If you know how to use it, it can be useful. It does restructure water, which is good. Um, you know, and if you're using tap water that's just, uh, you know, not clustered properly, the restructuring can be very beneficial. Uh, you can also adjust the pH. Now, a lot of people just think alkaline is good. And, um, well, balance is good. And it would probably surprise a lot of the pH buffs out there that the most ideal pH for your saliva and your urine should be 6.4, which a lot of people would maybe consider more on the acidic side. But again, it's all about balance and pH, whether you're uh, measuring oral or your urine, uh, you know, those are also um, integrated with other electrical factors in your body that, you know, we could talk about conductivity and, and other elements that, you know, I test, you know, when I work on people, I don't look at pH. I, I look at a number of uh, factors and then put that into an equation and then 
we find out what the ideal pH for that person should be. Now, if you're just cranking up the, the canyon and, you know, uh, drinking, <clears throat> you know, eat water all the time, it may be the opposite of what you need, <clears throat> or it might be right on. So um, uh, the best way to change your pH for the better is to measure it and then use calcium, which is the best way to aggressively move your pH in the right direction. But then understand that there's different types of calcium. And, you know, we don't take calcium just for strong bones, you know, cell salts and things like that are, you know, uh, more effective. But the calcium, again, will uh, move your pH, but there's neutral calcium, there's acidic calcium, uh, there's alkaline calcium. And, uh, you know, we make three products actually where you test yourself and then you use the right calcium in order to change the pH in the right direction for you. And you might have to take an acidic form. So somebody like that, for instance, if they think that they're going to do themselves a favor by just drinking highly alkalinized water, well, you know, actually it's going to be pushing you in the wrong direction for proper electrical resistance in your body. And what you want is a the lowest uh, uh, you know uh, the best most balanced electrical resistance because that's what makes everything else work in your body so it's not just about alkalinity okay enough of that so, i did have one uh, one question though on that is there in the way that we talk about health how there is no uh single uh one size fits all for every single living man and woman you know, I guess, depending on your Enneagram and who you are and how you've come in and if you run hot or cold, et cetera, is it different healthy pHs for different types of people? Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. Yeah. You know, that's why we do the testing. If somebody's testing their oral and their urine pH, there's a way to average those. You weight the saliva twice as much, divide it by three. And, uh, you know, if you do that for a week, then you would know what kind of, for instance, calcium formula to take or whether you need to go in one direction or the other either way. So we all have differences and we can have great diets. We can eat plant based, you know, if that's your thing, uh, you know, and do all this alkalinizing. But what you are entertaining in your consciousness is going to have a greater acidifying effect than anything you know, you can eat bushels of alfalfa sprouts and things that are very alkaline and still be highly acidic based on the thoughts that you entertain in your head and the emotions that you run through. So that old saying is really true. It's more important what comes out of your mouth than what goes in. But, you know, of course, food, as we always say, and, and, and your water, everything, uh, what you desire or what you're attracted to is really a reflection of your consciousness and those other things that are more important. So when you, uh, like with anything, uh, whether you uh, are looking for alternative medicine or dietary, if you're trying to fix yourself from the outside in, you're going to have very limited or temporary results. Uh, the changes come inside. And then when your diet reflects those changes inside, you know, if you're, uh, you know, attracted to healthier food, just because that's what you know, you're attracted to, that's what tastes better. That means internally your consciousness is, you know, in, in a good state, you know, somebody's attracted to junk food and, and all the, the stuff out there and you're eating Skittles all day long. I mean, you know, that's okay. You're not a bad person, but that is a reflection of where you're at on the consciousness level. So back to the movie, um, we did have a few challenges just to get out of the, out of the starting blocks with that <laughs> because, um, the Iconics film crew was on their way from Great Britain and we we're all scheduled. And then the scamdemic happened. And so that put a kibosh on that. And how much did that delay the film? I mean, this was supposed to be done. This was supposed to be out a year ago, probably. I mean, we've been so delayed. We've been talking about this for a, a long time. And I think people are starting to wonder if we had lost our mind, like, but yeah, no. Um, so we ended up having to do it all stateside. So originally, uh, Jamie Ike was going to be coming here, which would have been awesome to be able to hang with him. And all of that got, as Bear said, derailed due to um, lockdowns and restrictions. So we had to do it all here. And fortunately, uh, uh, Bryden Lando, Bear's older son and a good friend of mine and his lovely wife, 
Stephanie all just happened to live in LA and work in the biz. So they were, they took over and were able to find a great cinematographer and uh, production and all that. And we just kind of took it on ourselves. I took on um, some of the production as well with my background doing this. And so we just essentially did it like we do everything. We did it all in-house. And um, it was, it worked out really well because then we were really in control of everything uh, in terms of the content, the story, uh, and uh, had a, a, a beautiful, really, really small crew here that were very welcome. And we were shooting still in the, the times of the, of the uh, crown, the, the crown V. So, um, you know, there were some aspects of people in uh, Hollywood that uh, weren't really open to, probably weren't on our level, like, you know, were they going to, they were jibby jabbed and, and concerned they would need to be wearing a mask here. So fortunately, you know, we did have to navigate that and find the right kind of people to work with. So uh, fortunately there was an amazing guy up here, Mike too, who's a drone operator and, and cinematographer with drone stuff who lives in my town randomly. And so we hired him and he was amazing and got a lot of beautiful drone footage of the area, which you'll see in the film. And it just went really well. So we were fortunate, of course, uh, with any production, you're always going to have uh, other uh, elements to deal with. And Bear Lando here, the uh, the epitome of health. The one time I've known I've known him for 15 years, never seen him under the weather. You came down with something. You were ill during the shoot, and you guys will see it in the in the film. Bear is looking a little weathered. What went on there, dude? <laughs> uh, it was one of those rare times where we got a lot of drift from chemtrails, or maybe I was just stage fright. I don't know which one. Uh, but uh, I woke up that morning and I was like, whoa, I, I don't think I'm up for this. I mean, I just felt like, you know, I haven't caught flus or colds as we think of them, um, you know, for years and years. And I was, I was down for the count. And uh, so I just said, hey, I, I, you know, no way. And, um, but I kind of rallied later on that morning, uh, they were just going to do some B-roll and, and do some other stuff. And uh, the, the first opening scenes where I'm talking a lot out by the vines in, in, uh, in the North 40 over here, um, you know, I was just uh, doing my thing talking, but kind of, you know, hanging on to the fence at the same time. So I was like, yeah, not in good shape. And of course, it's like, oh man, this is this is a bummer, you know, the one morning. And uh, yeah, it was okay on about day three, but I just wasn't myself during the prime filming time. Yeah, so that happens, and that's part of uh, part of production. And uh, you came through great, and I think the content was phenomenal. And uh, it'll, you guys will notice though when when you watch it, uh, it's not the classic vital robust bear, but. You, you did a good job of hiding that and you came through great. So, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was interesting, man. It's you got, sometimes you gotta, you know, the conspiratory mind kicks in. Right. And it's of course, like, right. When we're about to shoot this thing, um, Kim trails in the air and getting dosed and all that. So, you know, the way the realm works with consciousness, we know there are nefarious things out there and call them the archons, call them, call them the demons or whatever, but they're out there. And, uh, we're, it seems like uh, since we've had some certain guests on too, our Telegram channel has been plagued with certain um, nefarious characters trying to come in and uh, rabble rousers and stuff. Also, there um, I've had a lot of people trying uh, bots and different, uh, I don't know, online personalities uh, pretending to be me on Telegram. So just remember, guys, I'm Alpha Warrior on there. If uh, check the username, if it's not Alpha Warrior, uh, it's not me. I'm not trying to get you to buy XRP or crypto. Okay, I would never hit you up on that. In fact, I don't personally message really anybody. So just block and report because we've ever since actually we had Tom Althaus on, it's gotten crazy. So I don't know if that's connected somehow to Tom's with Tom's messaging, but we've been getting a lot of. Um, weird, weird spam and all that stuff and attacking our online community. And that's why it's going to be great to move off these platforms on our own private platform, because we'll be able to better guard against that. But we appreciate all your patience with dealing with that, guys. And there are interdimensionals. Um, back early on in my career, I was uh, doing some work 
that allowed me to access a person's neurology in a very unique way. And also um, not just accessing on a diagnostic level, but ways to create dramatic changes in real time. And as I was developing that, there were um, always a, in the afternoon, you know, I'd be working with people in my clinic. Uh, something would just hit me and it's like I just felt like crawling out of my skin. It was it's unexplainable how it felt, but it was very uncomfortable, very unpleasant. And that happened for a little bit of time. Now, also at that time, I was uh, very close to, uh, and, and I just one of these stories, so take it or leave it. Um, I was working very closely with uh, traditional kahuna in Hawaii. who We had become friends. He'd sort of taken me under his wing. And of course, they're reading between the lines in different ways yet again. And uh, so I got together with uh, him and he said, uh, you know, you are being targeted. Whatever you're up to there, somebody doesn't like it. And uh, so first off, just the awareness of that. Um, what I was able to protect myself. And, and also we, we did some things, um, you know, not hocus pocus things, but just very real ground. You know, you know when you get into Native American and uh, Native Hawaiian, you know, they're very grounded people. It's not new age to woo woo stuff, but it would be considered supernatural by people from Western cultures. Uh, so that was my first, not my only, but my first episode of um, being targeted. And, uh, you know, that does go on quite a bit. And while we're on it, you know, a lot of what's going on on the planet with all these things, we're talking about chemtrailing and, uh, you know, the, uh, the microwave technologies and the things that are, uh, you know, in the pharmaceutical industry, all designed to make people not well. Um, those are designed and implemented by people that are also targeted. You know, when you get your, your politicians and your, you know, all these elitists so-called, you know, they're being targeted and controlled by these interdimensionals. They just do not have the inner strength, we'll say, to um, have their own mind and they are mind controlled. You know, we talk about people that are MK Ultra, then, you know, we had Kathy O'Brien on and, and by the way, uh, we need to get her back on. Um, well, she, and she has her special coming out on Iconic as well. Yeah. I think that just launched too. Yeah. yeah I, I communicate with her, uh, you know, routinely. So um, yeah, I, we want to get into some other things with her. So um, yeah, there's people that are MK Ultra on that level, but the real uh, mind controlled people are the ones that are MK Ultra and other people because they're controlled by the interdimensionals. And whether people want to believe in that level of uh, consciousness or phenomena, whatever, it's okay, but it exists. It, it really does. And, and you know, it, it's provable. So um, that was an interesting time. Wow. And, so how did you, how did you, uh, I know you, you kind of touched a little bit on it, but you, what was the resolution in the end there with that? Number one was awareness of what was happening, where it was coming from. Awareness is the cure for everything. Whether you're dealing with a so-called disease, it, you know, and anything you can think of, whether you're dealing with poverty, uh, you know, when you bring awareness into the cause within your consciousness, it is keeping you in those, uh, uh, you know, those areas of limitation and, and you know, lack of well-being, just the awareness itself is the cure. However, um, you know, with my own practices, uh, you know, and Deb and I for many years have, have, have worked about uh, learning how to just draw um, shields around us, we'll say, which are very, uh, very effective, very real and impenetrable when you keep your eye on the ball. So, uh, and then uh, with my friend, Sam in Hawaii, he, uh, you know, had his own understandings and similar ways to work energetically. Uh, before I went to Hawaii, and I've mentioned this just briefly, and I'll, I'll keep this vague as well. 
Um, I had another gentleman who is a Native American who was in his 90s. It kind of took me under his wing and I did an apprenticeship of sorts. And that's uh, when I jumped from alter, uh, conventional and alternative medicine. And I spent, uh, you know, during the last year of his life, he reminded me of some things we came together and also uh, put a lot of wrinkles in my brain. We'll just say that by showing me certain things. And um, we also used to travel together, uh, go places. Uh, and so he had places where uh, he used to take me. And uh, not physically, but very vividly real at the same time. And so when we were uh, in the midst of moving to Fiji, because I had a great little gig offer over there, and my kids were babies, uh, we came back and we we're sort of scrutinizing everything, okay. And then um, this other gentleman I'm talking about, he uh, made the passage. And all of a sudden, we got the bright idea to, you know, go check out Hawaii. And then I found myself, long story short, in a remote place uh, in Hawaii, uh, walking down uh, this path and sitting on this waterfall, uh, looking at this uh, kind of vortex shaped canyon. And it was the exact same place that uh, this other gentleman used to take me. It was, uh, you know, he considered his power spot. So that is what brought us to Hawaii and uh, why we moved there instead of Fiji. So wow. uh, those are some some more personal anecdotes. Yeah, and that is, uh, those are very powerful mystical experiences that I think really shaped a lot of your life, right? And a lot of uh, where you are today. Uh, and it's great that you're opening up more about those, um, those experiences and having those mentors to help you out. It, I, it, it almost reminds me of a Carlos Castaneda story or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never, I've yet to shape shift into a coyote, but you know, there are some <laughs> remarkable experiences, but you know, as they, as the Ike's brought out in the film, which I was, again, sort of surprised at is just going into childhood. And, you know, uh, when it was being filmed, uh, you know, there's a lot of dialogue and also long distance with the Ikes just about what was going on in my life back then. And, uh, you know, I was a handful and always in trouble and, you know, <laughs> reflecting back, I mean, always in trouble. Uh, <laughs> when I reflect back, I was just bored on my skull and did everything to, you uh, resist being assimilated into the Borg. A rebel. Uh, well, that's the rebel yeah, in you, yeah. right? And that's what's led you to where, what you've done your whole life is being a rebel and rebel with a cause for sure. Uh, one thing on the mind stuff, I've been, I was reading Colin Wilson's Mind Parasites, like a classic book. And mm -hmm. it's really interesting to think that you know, there are these thought projections or, and I think there's some synthetic carrier waves that the, uh, you know, what, what do you want to call the deep state or whatever are doing, they use to literally send in thoughts into, into people's minds. And I think people are more apt to be subjected to that when they don't have that awareness around it. So that was a really key point there is bringing up this concept of awareness. And I think self-awareness is key. I was listening to on the way here, because I have about a 45 minute drive to get here from my house. I was listening to um, some Steiner talking about the six uh, sort of principles or steps to do in your life every day. And I think this kind of comes from ancient Rosicrucian uh, methodology. But one of those is having awareness of your daily of your daily life and, and this practice of going backwards, a backwards look into your day every day. So like before you go to sleep, you literally start at that moment and you go backwards through your whole day and relive that day. And by just having that awareness, there's little simple practices you can do every day. I think those are really amazing uh, tips to have for safeguarding against potential mental mind parasite attacks or whatever technology they have. Uh, because we know that exists. Uh, um, it's called like thought to skull or messaging to skull technology where they can try to send messages right into your brain. And we know that there's been certain shooters and uh, you know, people that have come out and said, I've, you know, I had the, my dog telling me to kill him, or I've had these, you know, thoughts in my head. I didn't know where they were coming from. So 
uh, whether that's a, a, a form of synthetic technology. I think it's all sorts of different things. And I do believe there are entities, mind parasites, archons, whatever, that are above, as you say, the, in the hierarchy that are coming down and really uh, or below, you're, you're right, that are below um, that are affecting these uh, characters uh, that think they're in power. So uh, fascinating stuff there. Um, back to the film, um, one of the things that we do talk about, I think one of the major themes in the film is sort of this idea of obviously getting back to nature, but understanding nature as this sort of divine technology, right? This technology that can really get us out of trouble, but it's not nature that's doing it. It's us basically working with nature, us as this sort of divine um, uh, proprietor over nature. And I, this, this triggers the lefty liberal sort of green New Deal people because they have inverted this into this sort of thing where we need to be passive and let nature do its thing when really it's about us being the sort of the shepherds of the, of I don't know, uh, of the nature technology through our interaction with it, if that makes sense. Could you speak to a little bit about that, Bear? Sure. Uh, we are nature and we are the only level of consciousness on this plane that is capable of consciously manipulating um, the mechanics of nature to co-create. So, of course, the folks that would say that we're a blight upon nature are wanting to have the whole shebang for themselves and get rid of us. They do not, they desperately do not want us coming into our power and realizing, you know, that we are the natural forces and we're the only ones that wield those natural forces. And, you know, what you mentioned Steiner, Steiner uh, kind of riffing off the work of Goethe and others, uh, they discussed how at a certain time when, uh, you know, we're toddlers and we become conscious of uh, self. And then we start to develop more into the mental plane, then there becomes this split, which wouldn't not normally be a bad thing, but because of, uh, especially in our Western culture, not Western culture is bad. No, we do awesome things. And, uh, you know, what we're supposed to be doing is putting the two hemispheres of this plane together to get the best of both worlds, you know, not making one wrong or something. So uh, when we get the hang of um, uh, understanding these patterns and what Goethe and uh, Steiner talked about was how at that age we just go into one of the dipoles and therefore are just uh, more limited on the mental plane. And that reads into all of our five senses so that we're just using one pole only. And when we uh, are in nature and retrain ourselves, nature will retrain you if you spend enough time out there to use the other part of the dipole, then we are perceiving uh, you know, how to really use our vision, how to really hear, how all senses kind of bleed into each other. And, uh, you know, everything is revealed. We're not just trying to figure out things in our head. And of course, what uh, they're trying to do in our culture presently is just to bring us exclusively into our head. And they're shooting themselves in the foot. They think they're going to get into some kind of AI and live forever and do an end around, you know, Mother Nature. Well, it's impossible because if you are in that one uh, mental dipole only portion of the dipole, uh, you know, it's, it's again, the materialistic uh, idea that everything's coming out of our brain and then the brain will merge with the machine and everything, but the brain doesn't do anything. Uh, so on the, you know, if you get more into the etheric levels and, and uh, you know, everything that we talk about, uh, our consciousness, our will force, that is actually that creative element, comes directly from etheric. And then that is conceptualized in the brain, uh, another level in the astral, the, the emotional level, then that comes through the metabolic pole. You know, the, uh, the mental is more the neurological and alchemy, we call that the salt pole. And, uh, you know, the metabolic pole, the blood um, organ functions, uh, you know, that is more the feeling level. And then that is uh, the way we ambulate. That's the mercurial element in alchemy. 
you know, the, the uh, metabolic would be more the soul for our individualized soul, the metabolic part, you know, and we stand upright and walk around and, and do that sort of thing. Well, the part that gives us movement is the mercurial. And um, so all of those things come directly from etherical and, and then are conceptualized in the brain. And then they, you know, are translated through the three portions to make every part of our being function. And so if you think that you're going to take this piece of meat called the brain and merge it with a machine and somehow not be conscious of where everything comes from that is conceptualized through the vehicle in the first place, you know, you're dead or in a doornail. And uh, <laughs> so these guys are killing themselves. I don't know if they really I, believe that. I shit, think but. it's the gin or the, these mind parasites that are from the lower regions, you know, lower realms that have manipulated and, and played off the ego of these psychopaths to literally trick them into believing this in, in, a, in an attempt to try to get all of humanity into this eighth sphere, as Rudolf Steiner would right. call it, prison scape. And I think that is the, the sort of polarization that's happening. That is the dual pathway right now. It's like, are you going to keep suffering in normie uh, legacy systems towards this eventual digital hellscape of a simulacrum metaverse? Or are you going to go with the great awakening, go back to the land, go back to real technology, understand what we talk about and enjoy the new earth? And that's not like a new age thing. That's just really grounded in, you know, very esoteric concepts that these mystery schools are very aware of. That's what Christ was all about, right? Uh, understanding who we are. Uh, and um, that's what we're looking at right now. It's no, I don't, I'm not afraid the Russians are going to, I mean, I know there are some solid, I guess, ideas that the China, China is going to come take over America and stuff, but I don't. I don't worry about that because I just see that as that this is their plan. They are going to try to move us into a virtual world. They want us to all go virtual. And uh, China's like the leading role model for that. So <laughs> there's no need to have a hot war anymore because they've already got it. They think planned out. And I don't think I think they've been tricked into believing this by the gin or whatever the demon class or whatever those are. So uh, it is interesting because with awareness, it's easy to step out of that. And that's not to mean you don't just blindly not prep for, to be prepared for hard times that are coming because hard times are coming. Um, but uh, with the awareness in the community, I think uh, we're going to be thriving through these hard times. Yeah. And China's being used just like we were used as a military arm, you know, the globalists for a long time. Now China's being used. But remember, China, there's a lot of people over there and they aren't just these mindless robotons, you know, they are a little bit more conformist in the mainstream, you know, maybe than, than other parts of the world, but they're waking up just like a lot of us are waking up and they're rebelling. Of course, you're not going to hear about that, but it also might be the reason why the Chinese government is trying to kill a lot of them, especially the ones that are into certain practices that, you know, um, endeavor to explore their consciousness in different ways. So there's a wake up in this uh, entire world. And again, it's because people are now just what we're talking about, uh, understanding that there's something coming from the inside out, and we all want to explore that. And when that is stifled for too long, it will rebel. And so these folks are trying to herd cats for one last time, but it's not going to work. You know, uh, one thing that with our new website that's coming out, we'll get back to the movie too. Um, you know, we're going to have a whole membership uh, and area. And Mike, you can talk more about that. But one of the things that I'm really excited about is that we're going to have like a little mini university. Now we throw a lot of terms out here, you know, like a minute ago, we're talking about alchemical and, you know, certain things. And I know that's gobbledygook if you only just get little sound bites, like uh, I'll throw out sometime. But if you can sequentially go through these uh, concepts and then have a way to apply them, you'll see that it's very real and very logical. And then uh, in contrast, when you wrap your mind around certain things and then look at what we're taught, uh, you know, through conventional schooling and so forth, it's really nonsensical. So uh, that's one of the things that we're gonna do. You know, I had a great uh, discussion with some friends that were visiting the farm the other day, and they were saying, well, how do you pick out an herb, you know, in order to treat somebody? And uh, to me, it's very simple. 
of course, uh, you, you know, you can go into the chemical constituents and what they found and, you know, by extracting and isolating certain elements in plants, and that seems to have certain effects in different parts of physiology. Yeah, you know, there's a certain amount of truth to that, but it's all after effects. And then you can really get into more the esoteric concepts, and there's a lot of truth to that too, but it's much simpler. When you understand the three elements that make up every part of the uh, three kingdoms of nature, which includes us, all you have to do is look at things anatomically because you have the mercury, the salt, and the sulfur that are active in every one of us, every living thing, whether it's a rock, which is uh, alive and sentient, you know, it's just, uh, you know, congealed matter in a much denser form, doesn't have the ambulation. Uh, you know, higher forms of uh, consciousness uh, can ambulate and you can transition into that understanding and realize how that happens in an evolutionary way, not a Darwinian evolutionary way, but in an evolution of consciousness. Uh, Steiner, of course, talks about the zodiac and, uh, you know, the different constellations at resonance that unfold, uh, you know, different... Um, uh, levels of consciousness at different historical points, not in a deterministic sense. And also in a reverse time clock, you know, we talk about the sky clock, but he talks about it in a reverse uh, clockwise order rather than the embryological unfoldment that's uh, constantly going to create a larger toroidal field, you know, that unfolds embryologically to make our bodies and we get into that cell salts and everything. So we want to get into the weeds and all those concepts, isolate them. Uh, you know, just take people by the hand and, and walk through different concepts to see how we get, you know, from, from those kind of esoteric thoughts mm -hmm. to here. But back to the discussion, when you're looking, maybe somebody has um, a particular malady in their body. Well, depending what it is, you can vary with a little bit of practice. You can understand what imbalance between those three, you know, mercury, sulfur, and salt is uh, is happening and then you can just look at the anatomy of a plant and uh, very uh, quickly discern which element is very more prominent in that plant you know you have vines you have roots uh, you know uh, you know roots that are very prominent and other kind of plants that we would consider medicinal uh, you know you have flowers and fruits so that tells you if you just look with eyes and see exactly what energetics, uh, you know, what kind of balance creates that particular species. And then you can pair it up with where the imbalance in the person is, if you understand how to do that and forget all the mental work, just anatomically envision both pair them up and, you know, magic happens much more uh, readily and predictably than when you're in there thinking, well, you know, maybe they need this chemical or that, or maybe it's adrenal glands or so forth. So, uh, you know, we really mm -hmm. need to understand the larger patterns, understand how those patterns play out in every facet of nature, including ourselves, and just learn to look and listen. And of course, it all relates, uh, you know, back to spending more time in nature, which will get you more out of your head. Then when you do the schoolwork, if you want to go read Steiner and all those kinds of guys, fantastic, but you're going to get it much quicker than if you're just sitting behind a computer all day in the mental plane, because it's a much, uh, you know, the chasm between uh, you know, uh, understanding and, and the mental plane is much wider when you're in a synthetic environment. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, I think of the natives uh, that we really need to start looking to more and more native Americans and indigenous cultures from all over the world. They were the masters at just observing nature. Whereas with the science, quote unquote, scientific revolution and the, the time from the 16th century on, you know, we somehow got that inverted with the idea that we need to destroy and kill things, take it apart to see how it works. <laughs> you know, looking at dead things instead of actually taking the time to see them uh, properly unfold according to nature's laws and the, the natural um, way the realm works. So getting back to that is huge. And of course, we'll be embracing the digital, you know, synthetic world for our, our community on our own platform to allow us to at least make steps towards that. And I do think there is, you can get some heart resonance through a platform like this, through the connection, right? I do believe there are um, abilities through an online community to have 
uh, our etheric kind of self kind of come through the synthetic forms of the internet and connect. But then of course, we go a step further and we do in-person workshops, festivals and stuff and try to bring people together, have local gatherings, AV groups meeting in other parts of the world. That's gonna be the very, very powerful part of this platform is that we will have a whole section for meetups, allowing for community members to actually come together in the real world, which is for us super important. This this last weekend we had a bear, we had a little uh, get together here at our friend Alec and Emily's down the way. A bunch of music and sky and AV peeps came together. We had a nice uh, little uh, potluck and then went up and danced. I DJed an off grid uh, little ecstatic dance set, which is on my SoundCloud now. You guys can check out. I'll put the link below. And that was just wonderful. We all got to just hang out and uh, enmesh ourselves in each other's fields. And so our hope and is that this, as this community grows through this platform, which will be a, you know, a safe space, a safe space for us to come together, um, we can have more in-person meetups and uh, engage with each other in the real world. Yeah, and we have workshops coming up here. Uh, we have our first one uh, coming up in just a few weeks. It's going to be more in the legal realm. And by the way, those same concepts, as far as alchemical concepts uh, that we're discussing, can be applied to law and uh, get us back into a real system of uh, justice, uh, you know, that was envisioned by Article 3 of the Constitution, which mimicked natural law. And what we've uh, been brought into, of course, is the SALT polarity, the SALT, uh, you know, exclusively, which is a mental plane to the construct of our uh, birth certificate artificial self, uh, you know, which uh, separates us from our soul, which was, uh, you know, the sulfur element that was uh, what uh, the individualization of our will force, which was uh, intended through Article 3 of the Constitution, which is why in our legal system, we no longer have Article 3 courts. It's all uh, uniform commercial code. So uh, we don't, uh, when we are doing our legal seminar up, seminar up here soon with uh, Marcia Ann, uh, we're not just going to be getting into paperwork and form. We are going to be really uh, delving deep into the soul of, uh, you know, what was intended for the lawful system in the first place, how we have traversed into legal synthetics and how to get back and also how to do it in a way where you don't, you know, walk around with a bullseye on your chest, uh, you know, for the predators to just pick you off. And uh, some of us have been uh, operating in those realms for a very long time and uh, taking a lot of arrows in our back through the learning process. But fortunately, a lot of what we learned the hard way in years past is now available online and so forth. But it's now also time to take it to the next level. And we've got people that we're working with uh, now that are doing that. And primarily, it's taking us away from the War Powers Act and uh, making us, uh, you know, uh, teaching us how to become ambassadors of peace. And, um, you know, of course, every ill that we suffer nowadays is because we are in a constant state of war and we have all contracted into that War Powers Act. So we have to, um, you know, sequester ourselves from that and then it'll just wither and die on its own accord so uh with the movie back to that uh after we overcame some early obstacles uh you know we had a great amount of uh footage uh, my son bryden uh did a great job in doing some initial editing then it went over to great britain and the Ikes did the, the final editing and, and did a great job. Again, I was surprised that they made it a little bit personal, but I realized why they did that. Uh, talking with Gareth just the other day, Gareth Ike, uh, you know, I was just telling him, you know, the farm looks totally different now. You know, it's just a, a, a year later, we've done so much work. We've got a, a new lab constructed. We, you know, we're, you know, finishing our pond. We're doing all sorts of things. And he said, well, that's good. That'll, that'll be good for the next episode. So we'll be able to get a little bit more into some uh, 
other concepts and and more into the farm work. I guess for the first time, they just wanted to set the stage for some personalities and see who's behind this thing in the first place. Yeah, and you know the original scope and idea was that they were really attracted to not only just what we're up to here as a um, living off grid, which was very attractive to them because I know a lot of people are leaving the city, especially when we were first talking about this in 2020, uh, droves of people exiting the city and trying to figure out how they can live off grid and live off the land, but also, um, you know, concepts like the terrain we, we touch, of course, very, very important in relating the terrain of uh, the environment here and how we grow to the terrain of our body. That was a major theme. Uh, and so they had to lay the groundwork for that because Bear really is a pioneer in terms of being a practitioner, uh, actually putting this not just theory, it's not just theory, like this whole thing, terrain theory, it's not <laughs> theoretical, it is just is, it's natural law, it's just how the realm functions. And Bear has been putting that to practice for 40 years, so we really need to set that whole stage and now allow this to unfold into the greater narrative about how we're putting that into practice in our business, how we relate that to permaculture, and then also how this is a family operation. This is not some sort of corporatized, uh, typical business. This really is a family. Uh, I'm the only non-Lando and in, in really involved, my, and my wife, of course, supports, and my kids are in, my uh, children, my Two little boys are in the in the film. Uh, Deb has a great role in it. Uh, Bear's lifelong partner. Um, you guys have been together since. Am I right? Since high school? Is that correct? Um, or since right after high school? You guys no, knew each other in high school, uh, but grammar school. <laughs> grammar school. Um, you know, we didn't talk about it in the film. I don't know if we've ever talked about it, but do you guys think you guys have uh, been connected in previous lives? Yeah, that's an understatement. <laughs> um, okay, just uh, real quick on that. You know, Deb and I grew up in the same small town. Everybody knew everybody. We all had the same friends, but somehow we kept missing each other. There's a parochial school and a public school. And I was going to one, and, and then there was another little school off in the, the Redwoods, and she was at that. And then I transferred from one to the parochial school in second grade. Then she transferred to the one that I just left. And then, oh, about junior high school, she moved uh, in the Mill Valley, went to a, a public school, Tam High and Old Marin County, and, and I went to Marin Catholic. But we kept just uh, barely missing each other, but all had the same circle of friends. We just weren't. And, you know, we were all kind of, uh, Deb and I were both sort of um, outgoing personalities back in those days. And I had a, quite a sports background. So, you know, and she was cheerleader and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's not like we were, um, you know, not out available to meet each other, but we just kept missing each other. And uh, uh, I was in a football all-star game at the end of high school. A lot of other good notables, Pete Carroll, you know, who's the head coach of uh, the Seahawks now. He was on my team. Uh, also, he, uh, also a quarterback for the Chargers. Oh, yeah, Dan Fouts, you know. Just Dan Fouts. Yeah, he's my high school quarterback. And also um, <laughs> also in the movie, you know, they hold up, uh, you know, this picture of CYO basketball. We're like in the eighth grade. Dan Fouts is in there. You know, he was the forward on our team. Anyway, we had, <laughs> we had a fun time. We had uh, Robin Williams was, uh, you know, in the class at that time. Also, wow. also, it was an interesting time in Marin County. So uh, Deb and I just kept missing each other. Um, after the All-Star game, I remember going to this party in Mill Valley and, uh, I remember seeing Deb, you know, and she was kind of like in a little cheerle cheerleader thing. And I was, uh, you know, wanted to go scope her out, but I didn't quite have the courage. So uh, I didn't approach her. And, and then I'm, I'm away at college and uh, uh, maybe I'm getting too much into it here. But, um, you know, one of my best buddies, linebacker on the team, uh, you know, we're away at Washington State. That's where I went right after high school before I transferred to Utah. And um Anyway, he was always writing to his girlfriend and everything. We'd commute home and he was down in the, you know, more the San Jose area. And I, we'd commute and I'd go to, you know, where I was in Marin County and so forth. And, and uh, he was off to see, uh, you know, his family and his girlfriend. And it, long story short, it, it, Deb ended up being, <laughs> you know, the girlfriend at the time. Oh, so wow. we just had all these, 
you know, I, we're sitting around and, uh, you know, one day Deb said, did you ever know a guy, you played at Washington State, did you ever know a guy by the name of Mark Hall? Anyway, so we just had all these weird little things all the time and in connections, I could tell you a bunch more, but we just weren't meant to, um, you know, meet until a certain time. And then when we did, it was kind of like, you know, one of those instant zingers and, uh, and then we became quite the scandal at the time. So, um, <laughs> and that was almost 50 years ago. So uh, wow. yeah, you'll see Deb in the movie there. And uh, she's uh, the green, the true green thumb of the family, an amazing uh, agriculturist gardener. She comes from it just, uh, you, you know, she's very knowledgeable, but also just very intuitive, just, you know, can see stuff and what needs to be done. So uh, when in doubt, I always confer with her. Uh, you know, and uh, she's we, our yeah. she's really the general behind the scenes. Yes, yeah. the ship up, yeah. afloat and is uh, no nonsense, but very caring and loving the, the mother hen of the flock. Uh, and also um, her family, she comes from a really phenomenal um, place where her family was, which was uh, taken by it was an eminent domain. Yeah, the ranch uh, Point Reyes, which is the uh, um, now the. Um, uh, Point Reyes Seashore Visitor Center. So, I mean, that was, that was the old family house there. And then, yeah, eminent domain. And then they were kind of kicked out and she can't even go there anymore because, you know, now it's just tourists and everything. But uh, McClure's Beach, anybody who's visited that area, that that's her old family name, McClure. Wow. So, uh, yeah. She but, needed a land. They needed a land patent back yeah. then. And then my <laughs> relatives, uh, you know, in the same area, anybody with an Italian last name, there's a lot of Italians there. Every single one of them's like first cousin, second cousin, you know, we're all related and they are all buddies with the McClure. So we had all these family connections too, but in early childhood, just kept missing each other. Wow. What a cool story. You know, that's another grounding thing with Alpha Vedic because we're very family focused. Like I'm fortunate. I just uh, celebrated Father's Day with my parents camping who moved up here and they just celebrated their 50th anniversary, their 50th anniversary. So my parents have been together for 50 years. We just, uh, yeah, we're just fortunate. We, we have these like really solid family bonds here that uh, keep us going and for will forever. And uh, it's just a special, special place and special people. And we're just honored to uh, be able to share this with you guys. And the film really covers that, I hope, in a really cool way. You get to see three generations of Landos in it uh, with your grandson in it. And, uh, you know, it's the seven generations principle we really take to heart. So that's uh, one of the driving forces behind the company and what we're doing. Uh, we're all about building out uh, infrastructure here so that this place will last and forever, not only last forever, but be better every generation. Yeah, I, I feel fortunate too that I grew up in a Latin family. It's very, uh, you know, um, family oriented. Um, you know, it's about commitments, not just staying each other and being with miserable, but you really appreciate family, you grow more intimate as time goes on. And what I see happening now out there is uh, people go through relationships right and left, they get divorces. And, you know, bottom line, everybody quits before the magic happens. And it's really a shame. Because, um, you know, there does come a point in your life. And if you can look back and see that, that uh, that continuous stream and and see the uh, bonds of intimacy deepening over the years and and uh, you know then you're looking at your kids grown your grandkids you know it's it's very special and of course that also gets into what you're talking about which is you can look ahead and it's not just about your family but it's the the human family uh, humans not the right word it's the uh, family of mankind that is, um, you know, really bonded, really one organism. And we need to start appreciating that we have responsibility to uh, make their life better, even though they aren't here yet embodied. And that is, uh, you know, in Alpha Vedic, we have done a little bit of new structuring. It's private, so I don't want to get too much into it. 
but it has to do with the establishment of formal foundations. And our foundation is based on spiritual principles of seven generations. So that is our legal, lawful uh, mission statement as far as we are here to make generations after us uh, have a better experience. And I was just thinking it's actually kind of selfishly uh, endowed that way too, because we, we, I could be, or you could be one of those generations later as we reincarnate to come back and experience it again. So we, we want to make sure when we come back, the uh, ship's in good order here. Exactly. <laughs> and who knows uh, if you do a really good job in any embodiment, you just might be off the, the wheel of incarnation for good. And uh, as we believe uh, in our family, when that happens, you can have a much more powerful influence from behind the veil for the people that are uh, still having avatars within the simulation here. And, um, you know, we're also told that, uh, you know, we're going through a pretty intense transition here on this plane. And what's... Uh, there, not every spiritual or cosmic being um, chooses to embody because there are certain risks involved. And so angelic cosmic beings do assist us from the other side. And as we make way for them when they embody, uh, when it's uh, you know a more pleasant environment the way it was originally intended, before the dark forces, uh, you know, started playing with us, then um, we will be assisting those that are now assisting us uh, from behind the veil. So uh, that's, that's the circle of life. And that's really the way it works. And I think when you look at things from that perspective, but then also learn while you're still on this um, side of the veil to identify those patterns, work with them and validate them by working with them through agriculture, through laboratory sciences, through medicine. Um, you know, it becomes very real. It's no longer just a woo-woo concept or a mental concept. It's like, wow, that's really the way life's intended. It's the way things work. And that is what we were supposed to be aware of from day one so that we can be co-creators not, uh, you know, these uh, people that are responsible for screwing up the world uh, and, you know, global change. And, you know, we need to kill babies because they're parasites and all this uh, darkness that's going on right now. It's, it's beyond, I mean, it's beyond the pale. It's, I can't believe what I'm hearing, but that's okay. It's uh, when, you know, when you treat a sick body, uh, all the things that are responsible for the illness, when you treat a body uh, properly, you see them come to the surface and sometimes it looks a little uglier before it gets better. So all these um, uh, people that are, and I'm not saying this to degrade or, or to demean anybody, but they are literally retarded. Hmm. Um, I mean, that you can see it in their eyes. There's just confusion. There's no light. Um, they are not physically beautiful most of the time. We are supposed to be beautiful but they embrace ugliness and darkness and death. And uh, they are very mind controlled by the folks that are the most mind controlled. And so that's all in our face right now, but I would just tell anybody, uh, don't buy it. Don't be, you know, be aware of what's going on so you can make plans and protect your own families, but don't dwell on it too much because what your attention is on, you will become. So true mastery is about, you know, being aware, have your ear to the ground, be grounded and, you know, do whatever you got to do. And sometimes it takes a lot of elbow grease, but don't attach your consciousness to the things that you don't like because you will absolutely become that. And there's no way around it. It has to come into your life and manifest if your attention is on it, period. Oh, bingo. Uh, that is going to be cut into a clip and put out uh, <laughs> on inspired.com. No, that was uh, that was fantastic. And so so on point. There's been some chatter in the, um, the live stream chat here about Qigong. 
And that was a perfect representation of what you're saying there, where you put your attention, right, is where your energy is directed. And that is a daily practice that both Bear and I do. I mean, Bear, right before we went live, you had some of your Tai Chi balls out here and you're going through uh, your different motions. And I am uh, a neophyte, but I uh, highly uh, enjoy it. And um, I, I don't get too caught up in the technicalities. I just go with what feels good. And um, I tell you, it's a great practice to get out of your mind and uh, also um, learn discipline about how to direct your attention in the right ways. So yes, we do, to answer your question here, we both are fans of Qigong and different martial arts practices. What's the what's your favorite martial art to, to practice? I know you have specifics that you're into. Well, I think there's only one martial art in reality, and uh, you know, that's just internal awareness. But mm -hmm. uh, after football, um, you know, and I decided to, you know, get out of that game after college, and then... Uh, you know, I still kind of chalk mentality, still a gym rat, you know, enjoy training and competing. And I uh, went into the martial arts and the first thing I did was Taekwondo, which is what a lot of people, you know, first start with because it's, you know, kick punch and just pretty much straightforward. And then from that, I transitioned into Kempo, which is a little bit more circular, but still more of an aggressive external art. And then I uh, uh, went into the um, internal arts with Kung Fu practices and at the basis of Kung Fu are three arts, Bagua, Xing Yi and Tai Chi. And uh, so I did all three of those. I was fortunate to have some really good teachers along the way. And I've done it ever since. Uh, you know, I started that maybe when I got out of football when I was in my mid twenties or, or something. And, uh, you know, did competition, did full contact, you know, fighting. And it, back then it was, it was pre uh, MMA and it was more kickboxing. So, you know, it's really about, you know, uh, you know, doing kind of flashy kickboxing stuff. Um, so what I do now is, uh, I don't even know what you'd call it, but I use my uh, Tai Chi balls that are always on the ground here. And, um, you know, you're talking about uh, um, Qigong. It's just simply uh, projecting your energy wherever you want it. And, you know, when I'm doing drills, this is what uh, the old Tai Chi people used to use. It was their main training tool. And there's different sizes that I have down there. This is a little For bit For those smaller. listening to the podcast, I'm holding a wooden uh, Tai Chi ball here. So, um, you know, you learn how to project your energy and, you know, I had to do that in just my regular work in, in the healing arts, um, you know, because when you're doing acupuncture, if you just, if you ever go to an acupuncturist, by the way, and you stick some needles in you and then walk to the next room, treat somebody else, that's not acupuncture. They're supposed to be with you projecting energy. Otherwise it's, it's like in uh, martial arts, you know, you see people doing pretty forms and everything in a park. You look at them and you can tell if they're moving energy or not. And we call it empty forms. You're going through motions. It might be a nice exercise. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not true martial arts. Same thing with, uh, you know, acupuncture, Chinese medicine. It's always about being able to project your energy from the inside out and also qualify that energy so you can have different effects. You know, you qualify it with colors, with intensities and all sorts of things. So when you're uh, doing this, you know, you're always uh, moving at your core, you know, so you're training yourself just how to move physically, but you're always completing the circle through the microcosmic and then out through your arms. And then you can actually feel the energy come through the ball. And when you really get to the flow of it in the flow, then the ball just becomes lighter and lighter in your hands, almost feeling like it's floating because you're projecting the energy through and you can actually feel it go through the wood and then, you know, you get in the flow and the movements you're doing are really mimicking like in Bagua is the best, you know, as far as, um, uh, you know, just integrating with the circular waveforms that are permeating through the ethers at all times. And the same thing with Tai Chi ball, you know, you're, you just kind of get in that flow and you're going with those natural patterns that are always in the atmosphere and you, you know, literally become one with your surroundings. And, you know, that's, again, that's not woo woo. It's a real physical experience that anybody um, can experience, but you know, you, you have to put some time in and it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, but then when, you know, you just start getting, you know, more of a sequential, uh, development and, and just awareness. It's, it's not any, 
anything f- phenomenological either. It's just like, oh yeah, okay. And then you just take it in stride. And then pretty soon you're doing some pretty cool stuff that uh, maybe years ago you would have thought would was kind of fantastical, but it's really not. You just go, oh, okay, I get what those old guys are trying to tell me now. Wow. Um, Cardamone is in the chat. He said, looking forward to AV University's Tai Chi for retards course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, great to have you in here, brother. You always, I love you, man. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, we were saying some of those effects, are you saying like, besides increased vitality and stuff, are you saying like easier to lift things? Like what are some of the things you've noticed in your life uh, from doing this practice that have, have great, you know, effects on your life? We know my body's changed. I look in the mirror, don't recognize myself anymore. And, you know, I got pictures over there and I was 280 pounds and bench pressing 500 and, you know, and all sorts of crazy stuff. So, okay, I have a different kind of body, but also doing those uh, external. (laughs) Oh, God. Look at the neck on that dude. It's bigger than two of my thighs together. (laughs) Okay. That's Bear Lando. Uh, but you see that in the film. But anyway, <laughs> I just totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> so, um, you well, know, changed, your body it? changes and, you, you know, realizing that, okay, when you're in that kind of external prime and doing that kind of competition from that perspective, you know, you suffer a lot of wear and tear, which makes you look the way I look now. But if you're fortunate enough to develop some internal practice at the same time, then when you go through the alleged aging process, and there's no reason why the body, age, well, I know exactly why the body ages, but it's not designed to do that. But, um, you know, you don't lose your vitality. You don't, uh, in fact, you, in some ways, you know, Deb and I, we feel like our stamina is even better in the old days when we're, you know, training professionally for sports because Deb was an amazing athlete too. Um, so what we notice now in our phase of life is, okay, things are different, but all day long, you know, we're just carrying heavy boulders and, you know, digging holes and on our knees, getting up and down and walking miles, just, you know, doing what we have to do to keep a farm going. And, you know, we do the majority of the work around here. We have some people that come and help us sometimes, but mostly it's just been us, you know, for a lot of years now. So, um, and not only are you physically active and needing to keep your engine going all day long, uh, but, you know, we've done it for a lot of years now and it does develop kind of a core that uh, is a different kind of strength. You know, when I used to train for sports, like say football, I'd get in phenomenal shape. And when I went to two days, I'd actually get out of shape because I was so well trained before that. But I had to get in a different kind of shape, this football shape, you know, because you're hitting and doing different kinds of things. Uh, Working here on the farm, it's kind of like football shape. You know, you can, uh, you know, we have uh, some people that come donate a few hours here and there. And in some of them, you know, train and work out. And they come and they notice after just a couple hours of farm work, they're tuckered out because it's a whole different kind of thing, uh, you know, a different way of using your body. So uh, from an internal perspective, yeah, you develop in other ways so that even though you're supposed to have a few years under your belt, uh, you're not compromised. And in fact, you can put in a fuller, more productive day of work than maybe, you know, I would have cared to back in earlier years when I looked a lot more buffed. Yeah, that's great. Um, you brought up something about aging, and I think this could be a great last topic to talk about because we've been kind of been trained in modern, modern man that, uh, the end of life process. And my wife is, you know, she's a hospice nurse, so she deals with this on the daily and God bless her for what she does. Uh, but you know, we end up in a hospital bed with IVs and all sorts of machines in the hospital. And that's kind of, you know, where the end of life is. If you're lucky, you get a, you get a diet home in bed sickly, but really that's not how the life spring life stream was, is, a, was originally designed or that we've designed that we've contracted to end, right? That's, that's a infringement upon our free will in some ways. Um, really, as you, you, you've told this, I think on the podcast before, was it your, your grandfather, how he went, 
literally just decided, okay, it's time to go. Still super vital. I think he was even building a wall at that time in his late mm-hmm. 90s. And that's how the design is, right? The design he's is six. Uh, he was 106. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, two questions. Well, one, when you're d- talking about these martial artists, did you know of any? There's these legends of these masters that are 150, you know, that are out there still doing their things. Do you know of any of those types that have defied the traditional uh, longevity, uh, me- you know, ideas of how long we can live? And two, why do we age? And um, will that change? Um, I've read a lot about some of those characters. They even have a place, you know, in, in China up in the hills, they call it the, the Valley of the Ancients. You know, they're kind of in the ascended master realm. The old school way of making your ascension was developing a, an awareness of how to stay in your body long enough to connect the dots so that you could. Uh, you know, eventually with that growing awareness in the same embodiment without, you know, coming in and out and having amnesia every single time, uh, you know, they would be able to make their ascension with the new dispensation of which we are uh, appreciating right now. You don't have to do that because our initiations are in the outer world. And when we learn to maintain harmony and control of our emotional state in a productive way, not suppressing emotions, but channeling it uh, for creative purposes. Uh, Also, it will um, create the internal changes that will allow us to go through that ascension process. Now, in the martial arts world, I did work with some people that were from the old country that were, you know, in their 80s. And, uh, you know, and back then I looked different. I was younger. And, uh, you know, sparring and you know fighting and full contact and you get in with these guys and they're just so elusive and it seemed like they weren't even moving but they're just always barely you know out of the way whatever you try to throw (laughs) at them and smiling the whole time and then every so often they just kind of do a little flicker that would come out of nowhere and and you know they pull their energy because if they didn't they'd kill you i mean literally you know lacerate a liver or do whatever if they could project energy that well but still you know they gave you a little love tap and it felt like you got hit in the head with a baseball bat or something so those guys are very adept you know they are running around uh didn't meet any immortals in my travels <laughs> uh you know what made the transition for me when i was doing heart styles and competing i went uh, uh to study with this one person I'll make this real short. And it turns out that um, he just sat me down. I was very disappointed at the time, but stuck with it. And he taught me how to, you know, activate all the energies around the central channel, then the extended channels. And, and uh, you know, one at a time, I went, you know, with him for a long time. And if I was having a hard time connecting, he'd kind of give me a little touch. And all of a sudden I'd feel zing. I go, oh, that's where it is. And so I learned how to run the energy. That was what kind of made me transition. So, um, you know, as far as aging, aging is nothing more than congealed fear uh, and fear that gets habituated neurologically. So I think if there's any one thing that just uh, any normie should do, if they want to um, undo that habituation, is uh, the field of somatics. Somatics is wonderful. You know, I started back in the 80s, used to kind of warm up for regular athletic stretching and, and things. But um, when you uh, study somatics, you learn about three um, reflexes. Uh, one they call red light, another is green light, another one is a trauma reflex. So red light is, you know, through, I don't care what age you are, but uh, by the time you get on in years, you know, you see people kind of hunched over and like they're walking on marbles and it's because they're guarding themselves and that guarding of those uh, muscles neurologically becomes entrained so that now you're just kind of like permanently that's that's why an old person is not just you know standing up straight and and, you know with the same robust walk and so forth and then the green light is you know when we're on that uh, fight or flight it's kind of the opposite but has the same effect and so you can have somebody that's hunched over but still have like a back issue or all these other things it's because they have muscles contracted, you know, they're in that, you know, go, go, go kind of thing. And those muscles get habituated. And then those are just have a chronicity of uh, tension. And then in the process, other muscles, 
you know, you forget about them. And we call that sensory, uh, um, sensory motor amnesia. So uh, somatics is about a practice where you re-educate the muscles that, you know, you get in touch with the ones you've lost. And then you tell the other ones that are habitually, you know, in, uh, you know, one particular state or the other, that they can relax and, uh, you know, go back to normal function. And in the process, when you do that, you have all the, the emotions that have been stored in those muscles, you know, in the field of clinical kinesiology, we understand that uh, muscles uh, were the display panels for all the organs in the entire body. So in the field of somatics, what you're able to do is to release all of that that you know created the display panel to be in a certain way and with somatics even though it's very gentle compared to athletic stretching what you're able to do is uh, gain a lot of youth it has reflexes on your internal organs and it will really undo a lot of the things that you've habituated over the years so uh, you know you don't have to get into fancy martial arts or, or any advanced concepts you can do something very easily that can work on every level of your being and give you a level of suppleness and range of motion that you would not be able to get if you at that same point in your life started doing yoga or something. Nothing against yoga. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, great modality. I recently had some uh, stress headaches I've been dealing with forever and I came to bear, <laughs> I need help. And so he got me dialed on it and uh, I have now uh, added it to my practice and it has helped massively and we will have more of that instruction and those types of um <clears throat> different modalities and stuff in the private membership group we'll have whole for we have forums and groups and we'll have a somatic group on there and so people can get more education about uh, how to go through that practice because there are specific forms and, and specific techniques to that uh, and yes we're saying somatics well, the, uh, not cymatics, somatics. I, I like to um, get a little bit more involved with the somatics. You don't have to, but if you, and this is one thing I'd really like to get on some videos that are available. Um, if you know how to uh, grow an awareness of the meridian channels that you're activating in different somatic movements, then you're doing qigong through those um, meridians at the same time and really getting uh, a compounded effect, I'd say, as far as what you get in Qigong only, uh, you know, with a greater specificity, as well as the benefits of somatics. Wonderful. You're doing acupuncture on yourself is what you're doing. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Rebecca Armstrong had, you know, we've, we've already kind of talked about this today. I don't know if you've just come in a lot of talk about how we are transitioning and a splitting of worlds. So yeah, we've really discussed that today. Uh, one note on that, of course, is uh, the splitting of worlds too, is you'll have the public world, the commerce, the living dead world that's going to continue on what we call normie world. That's going to get harder and harder to try to exist in that world as they as I already said, start to transition people into the metaverse, into this digital simulacrum. And then you have the private, you have the world of the living men and women that, that people are reawakening to. And that is the, that is where we are headed. That's where the, the great awakening is going. And that is uh, literally understanding true natural law and who we are as um, divine beings. So, uh, and that of course will escalate into uh, ascension and all that. So, uh, but we can, what's great is we can ground that in very pragmatic terms. You have the public commerce, living dead world. Then you have the private real, uh, the living men and women of who we actually are. Uh, and that's where we exist. <laughs> So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, hey, this has been a great in-house in chat. We covered a lot. Um, uh, when does the, the thing premiere? Uh, Saturday, it goes live. So I'm assuming midnight. It's in UK time, I think, is when it's based. So uh, that would probably be midnight or one in the morning uh, on Saturday. It should go live. That's on Iconics uh, uh, Network. We will, in the show notes below, I will put our uh, affiliate link, which will give you a 10-day uh, free trial. It's a, usually a seven-day, so we're giving you an extra three days to play around in that network. Like we said, uh, there's um, other uh, recent documentaries and uh, really great programming on there, too. 
uh, that has, that's coming out. So support the Ikes. You know, I know there's chatter in here. Why are you with the Ikes? They're, you know, David Ikes, a 33 degree Mason. He's a part of the Luciferian inversion agenda. Well, personally, I haven't seen it. Okay. If people want to um, express those opinions, that's great. Um, we respect your opinion. We haven't seen it. They've been nothing but wonderful, uh, allowing us to make uh, the film how we want to make it. Um, they also funded it. So that's another reason why we're working with them. And also we respect them as Bear opened up the talk, you know, going way back in the 90s with David. Uh, so uh, they're also a family operation like ours. They're, uh, his two sons are running the operation, uh, Gareth and Jamie, and their wives, like Jamie's, uh, I think it was either Gareth's or Jamie's wife was one of the main people uh, kind of engaging with us on this. So they're keeping it in the family. And uh, so far, so good on my end. And they've supported people like Andrew Kaufman. Uh, they uh, did the, they, the terrain film. What has so, David ever said that could possibly be a detriment or mislead people in any way? Okay, maybe you don't believe in uh, interdimensionals or reptilians or something. I, I actually understand, uh, you know, long ago when I knew him and he got into the reptilian stuff, I'm like, okay, now you lost me. Uh, but now I actually understand what that is, and yeah. um, there's truth to it. But if you listen to his message, he's talking about realizing your true spiritual potential and manifesting that into this world to create heaven on earth. So somebody tell me where the darkness is here. And then I would challenge anybody who is saying, oh, he's a 33 degree, you know, whatever you're, you know, repeating that you've heard somewhere, what is your personal experience with that man? What is it? I would bet you have no experience with that person. You never looked into his eyes. You, you, you have nothing to base it on except for gossip. And back to our earlier statement, when you engage in gossip, I don't care if it's just somebody that you're talking about that you think is uh, somebody you'll never meet, uh, whatever you're gossiping about as far as what you consider negative qualities in that person, you are now incorporating that into your energy field and you are becoming that. So gossip is not a cool thing because if it's not true, you're actually creating harm to the person you're gossiping about, even if you think, well, I'll never get back physically to them. Well, again, we're one interconnected web and that is bad juju. You are sending to somebody else and the law of the universe, it's going to come back to you. And if you have no personal experience to base your opinion on, and you're just repeating some shit that you heard somewhere, then, you know, shame on you. So just shut up unless you know firsthand. Bingo. And remember, every thought, true mastery is mastering your thoughts. The thought forms are real. They have real uh, weight in the etheric, right? So when you're sending out these nasty thought forms, as Bear said, you're going to, there's repercussions to that. So let's focus on our self mastery. Let's focus on getting grounded and, and really on what matters the most, which is our inter interpersonal relationships. First and foremost, get solid with yourself. If you're having fear about others uh, being a 33 degree Mason, uh, you're obviously distracted from what's important. And then two, um, who in your life you're connecting with and how you're if, you know, following your hero's journey and your creative path, which is really what this film is all about in the end, was about what we're doing as creatives. Brian Lando, he uh, does all of our beautiful graphics and uh, like our product that we don't have any right here. I was going to show some of our products all the design and stuff. We take that all very seriously. That's all part of Alpha Vedic. Like this hat I'm wearing, uh, the shirt you have on Bear, like that's all Brian and Lando. That's his creative flow. We let him shine. Bear, obviously, as the alchemist and as the prime <laughs> director and creator of this, like he, we do this because this is fun. Um, myself with the media and the podcast and the website and all, all the other things, music and sky and Cordal. Like I'm allowed to go off and flourish and do these things. So once yeah, again, and Mike, I'll say if it wasn't for your efforts, nobody ever would have ever heard about Alpha Vedic or any of us in the first place. So there we go. It's it's finding that mastery inside you to know what your mission in life is and then go do it. Go do it. Because then the world will unfold in magical ways and the David Ikes of the world or whoever, you won't have time to even gossip because you'll be too busy crushing it. 
So uh, I think this is a great way to end it, guys. Uh, bam, Saturday, check out the film. We'll all be here watching it. We'll have a, we're gonna have a little watch party here with some of the crew and local people that supported us. Um, shout out to Mike Cutherson for being the drone operator. Shout out to um, Shannon here for supporting us. Um, uh, everyone else who supported us in the shoot, uh, you guys are awesome. Um, Steph, of course, my wife, my parents, um, Baron Deb. I mean, it's just been a wonderful, wonderful process to see this finally come out. Um, and I can't wait for you guys to see it. And fr quite frankly, I can't wait to start shooting again because we have so much more to show now. The farm yeah. and everything's grown so much bigger. I mean, we shot this, guys, lap, not this last May, but the May before that. So this is literally a year ago, over a year ago that you're going to yeah, be watching. I'm, I'm partially like, oh, God, you know, won't even show anything we're actually doing now. But, you know, <laughs> I'm sure it'll work. Hey, we love you guys. And hey, thanks so much for uh, hanging out with us today in the chat. Thanks, Diane Kay, for all your wonderful ads in the chat and EW. And of course, seeing you there in Hulda. Hopefully I said your, not, your name right. <laughs> love your energy. Uh, and thanks for your support. Uh, and everybody else in the chat today, you guys are awesome. Uh, and we'll see you next week with Devin Verana, I believe is going to be with us. Oh, from, awesome. Yeah. And she's going to be fun. She brings it. And she's awesome. Uh, uh, in terms of music and sky, um, official announcement is coming out next Tuesday to the list. Join the music and sky list at music and or alpha Vedic. We'll send the alpha Vedic list to a uh, very, uh, very special announcement of the dates and where it's in, where it's going to be, and uh, tier one pricing uh, is going to go fast. Uh, and this is an, a new, new type of event we're doing. Very experiential, very uh, personable. There's no VIPs. There's no pedestal. There's, you know, uh, people that are coming to talk that you probably know very well, or just coming to hang out. They're going to be right next to you at the fire. They're going to be hanging. It's just a really cool style of event. Um, there's no backstage or VIP anymore. It's just everybody together. That's where we're going. It's all about community. It's all about just appreciating each other. So I uh, love you guys. Any final words there? Yeah, love you all a lot. Thanks for being with us. Hope you enjoy the movie. Awesome. We'll see you next week, guys. Cheers.